Howdy, folks. My name is Lawrence Neely. I'm from Olin College. I'm the moderator, which means I get the less attractive chair. <laughs> so this is my first time moderating a set of keen talks, but I presume that the role of moderator is to keep you all from overwhelming them with your abundance of questions and your efforts to make connections and share your curiosity. So how about we just start with you? I, of course, have a few questions of my own, and I'm clearly in a position to, to exploit my proximity to just ask my own questions, but I'd love to hear from you all. Any thoughts, any questions? And I'm also a professor like all of you, so I have no problems cold calling people. <laughs> How did Tycho Brahe die? <laughs> How did you die, Margo? So, um, <laughs> so okay. Uh, it turns out he wasn't murdered. It's a great paper. It's got a great, like the title of the paper, you know, was Tycho Brahe murdered, part one. And no, um, he only had as much mercury in his body as like apparently every other Renaissance natural philosopher because they were all kind of messing around with um, uh, looking for the philosopher's stone and alchemy and that sort of thing along the way. So, uh, so the, the best thinking right now is uh, kidney disease. I, they didn't find kidney stones, but there's other, anyway, yeah. <laughs> to be continued. Oh, that's cool. um, so, how do you find something that matters that scopes well? I mean, there's, as a curiosity thing. How do, how, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, how do you, um, I find that uh, I define an area and I scaffold what the students need to do in their solution. And then they can pick what it is they're working on. But to keep it from being, right, I'm gonna solve world hunger in these next two weeks. Uh, or I'm going to move this piece of paper from here to here in these next two weeks. It's a solution to this problem has to do X, Y, and Z that are you know, technical outcomes for the class. You have to demonstrate that you have exhibited these mindsets, A, B, C, uh, and then in that space. And also, um, I ask them to, to draft a lot. So they draft their problem statement and I give them feedback on that. And they draft their approach and I give them feedback on that. Yeah, just pushing them out the door, I think things tend to get too big. I'd love to follow on just sort of conceptually, because all of you have talked about really compelling ways of engaging students. And I wonder how you think about how you do that at scale, right? How, if you're presenting something unique, how do you make sure that what you pick actually connects with all of your students? You go first, man. No. I've been <laughs> okay, so, so let, me, let me clarify. Do you, are you looking at uh, scaling with size or just connecting with, you know, there's so much diversity in our students, how do you connect it? Is that? Yeah, more, I mean, like, okay. so presumably everyone is going to accept the textbook, right? right I can right. probably, Everyone would like, dislikes right. it equally. Right. But if you pick some special topic ah, or something okay. that's, that's compelling, like, I don't like that bit of history you picked up. Like, I'm going right. to throw this all away. How do you deal with that? Right. So, um, so with my, it, it's interesting because when I present um, the example I gave with the rundown resort in northern Michigan, um, there's a lot of, a lot of folks that, that look at me and they're like, why, why, why a rundown resort in northern Michigan? Um, because of Lawrence Tech, you know, a lot of our students, you know, they, they have a place they go up north. It's always about up north. And so I kind of look at the demographics of like, what's going to cater to the most amount of students? Am I going to hit 100% um, of the students, you know, that, that special spot where they're like, I want to solve this problem? Um, probably not. Uh, but, but you can try to, try to get the majority. If, if they've got some, some friends, let's say on a, on a class assignment team, um, that are invested, they'll get invested too, just because their friends are. And that's the way you capture, that at least I'm able to capture the other 10% or so that might not be like, I don't do up north, you know, or <laughs> whatever. So. Other thoughts? I mean, I don't, I, I, I had my uh, chair ask me this, you know, you have these kits, you have maybe 40 people in your class. What happens if we go to 100? I was like, all the merrier. Right, like I want to dive into this. The only way you really understand, I think, a scaling problem is actually to go for it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you have a strategy going in. Like what I do is, I have multiple people that I use, multiple students, former students, 
um, because I do it at an early class, I can pull in juniors and seniors that want to help and also want to learn a little bit more. And I just flag them down the aisles, right? And they're going in and they're helping students. Robotics may not be the thing, but we try to find something fun and we try not to tie that last competition into a big portion of their grade. It's more of a exposition or, a, or, or something like that, right? So um, it's something that encourages them without stressing them. I got one more thing, but you, you got go. one more thing. Okay. Um, well, I'll just share that um, I ran into this in my class because not everybody likes robots, of course. And uh, uh, I actually had so so when robots are doing line following, like theoretically, that's very close to autonomous vehicles and the collision avoidance aspect and all that. And I have a student; she hates cars, <laughs> like she hates them. So whenever we do that example, you know, uh, one thing that I found that that sort of helped is to broaden the scope of what you're doing and stop focusing on that thing and that task as like the end goal, right? Uh, because there are mathematical like constructs that are important to that problem that are also important to problems that she is interested in. Uh, so I think that helps a lot as well. Yeah. And I'll echo, I'll echo Tim's thoughts on the, on the physical scaling. I mean, when you get like 60 robots and, and some of them are breaking down and you know, you got kids going down and stuff, it, it is tough, but if you commit to it, it, it can be done. Sure. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention like the idea of having uh, working for a client, working because you care, uh, working because it's like what you're going to do when you grow up, they don't have to be mutually exclusive and they can be additive. So at the, in the same project, there will be some people who are into it because it's the thing they care about, but there'll be others who are persuaded by, okay, yeah, I admit I'm going to do this later. Fine. <laughs> and that works. Awesome. Thank you. So Andy, on the uh, Easter egg uh, front, when you're trying to come up with a new problem or something like that, how, uh, do you have any advice for somebody that's looking for Easter eggs or how to embed Easter eggs in, in problems and, and things like that? Yeah, I was hoping you'd ask that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we have a question later? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the first thing I'll do is I'll actually take a, take a quick look at my learning objectives um, before I've even put together like the assignment and just say like which one of these like has an opportunity in it that caters well to just like that little real world clue that they may or may not pick up on. Um, and so it turns out like for my example with fluid mechanics, it's like ah, the, the pumping thing is great because it, you know, sizing these things, it really takes some, some students some knowledge, but it doesn't always have to be a pump, right? So, um, so I just keep playing off of that same theme. You're able to you know, come up with kind of a new assignment and project like every single term. Um, but it's still got that same nugget, that same kernel. So, um, you know, so sometimes it's like, you know, a desalization plant. Um, another time it was a wildfire protection system in California Vineyard. But all of those require, you know, that little like, how can I, how can I cut back my costs or make the solution more elegant simply? Just, just make it simpler. Why be so complex? Um, so look at the learning objectives. Um, and then the other is to kind of tap into your own expertise in that area. Like, what do we do? when we're a practicing engineer? Uh, what do we do that's just a little bit different that you wouldn't think about yet for the first time you're practicing this stuff in textbooks? And that's the key, right? We're the experts in this, and this is the first time they're trying that out. Um, so it's always, always great to just go, you know, how many times do we drive past a water tower? And as a fluid mechanics guy, I think about, oh, wow, that's, that's a lot cheaper than gigantic pumps supplying all our water. But the students don't think of that. Can I ask you a quick question? If there were a card on Engineering Unleashed that had Easter eggs for particular topics, might you look at that card? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I got to go start making some Easter eggs. <laughs> um, so, uh, sort of a general question, and this probably depends on the level of the student you've got in a given class. How do you balance, I mean, I, I, I teach computer science, so I can have a really elegant computing solution that still might not do the job well. How do you account for that? Do you worry about it? Is, is that a thing? Where you, where you get like, this is beautiful in the sense that it's a ball of duct tape, but it does accomplish the one little thing I gave you to do. <laughs> but I would fire you if you tried to make this a product and you handed it to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I can definitely speak to that. Um, 
in terms of our final robot project, which is line following, uh, the students, the second project, which I didn't talk about, is actually like a dead reckoning navigation system. And students are developing closed loop velocity control, and um, they're using proportional integral control and these uh, really nice tight controllers. And then they try to, a lot of them try to sort of wrap other feedback controllers around those in the final project. And they get into trouble because um, you know the dynamics start interacting and they get nonlinear effects and all kinds of odd things. Uh, and so to balance the sort of elegance with the effectiveness, uh, we take care of a lot of that in the report, right? And we look for evidence of uh, justified design decisions. And uh, we make a big point of having everything be completely supported in the design report. And I think that helps a lot. Um, so that way, even if a student has what could be a good solution, but they had an implementation problem, or, or vice versa. They basically just kind of went through using trial and error. They found a great solution, but it's not well supported. Both of those things kind of come out in the wash when the report comes out. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so, so for us, actually, um, in, in our control systems course, because we're trying to encourage students to fail over and over again, uh, we sort of use a ratcheting grading system that, that really rewards improvement. So in theory, you could actually fail the first two projects and fail the first two exams and still get an A in the course. If you demonstrate by the end that you've kind of hit all the marks and the learning objectives, you're good. But specifically in grading the report versus the performance, they are half and half. They are half and half. So, so um, if you have a really excellent report, you can, you can still fail the project. Uh, but if you, have, um, if you have a really bad report, but your, your robot looks great, we have no idea where that came from. So that's, that's also a 50. Um, so it's tough, uh, and, and, it, and it definitely stresses the students out. But again, uh, I think there's a lot of value in, in doing that, because that, that is what it looks like on the outside. Was that? I mean, I can let you know that, like, so freshman, sophomore level where I work with, I have to build up those things. And so I'll have the robots identify something in front of them first, right? And have, like, LEDs that go off or something very simple. And they'll do each of those objectives as scaffolding pieces along the way. And they'll see it working, but then they'll also see that there's other ways that you can create, you know, while loops or something like that that's a lot nicer than using conditional statements, right? Or could be, right? Um, and so at the low level, they're trying to wrap their head around pseudo language, right? And how to develop that well. When I get into the advanced level, now I'm actually handing them pieces of code and having them add functionality to it. And each of those examples that I kind of pull from those same robots that you were using, the Zoomo bots, mm -hmm. they can have a lot more complicated code that has C++ running in the background, and they have to edit that, and they have to see where those things are going. So they start digging into those. But at the start, they need to have an idea of the structure of the code. And so building those along the way and then taking that into the advanced level courses um, by having them see new code, what code is written out there. Does it do the function? Can you make it do it better? Those are the things that I think they, they now see. Oh, well, if Fanuc gives you a robot, uh, or you buy a, fan, uh, a robot from Fanuc, Fanuc would never give you one. <laughs> um, they, uh, they're not going to program it for you. They're going to tell you you can do whatever you need to do, and then they're going to expect you to know how to set that up or somebody at your company. So um, a lot of times they'll take a code but is that the best one to use, right, um, to, to start? So yeah, I mean, I think, I think you got to build it up through the curriculum. And I agree that it's, it's rather challenging to grade those types of things. But I think at the lower level, you can start creating the structure that you want your students to do, or at least the, the thought process. Uh, so I'm going to ask a little bit of a provocative question, which uh, is going to tear apart your cars and robots and fluid mechanics. So we've been, you know, we've been struggling with diversity in engineering, uh, and we're working hard to try to bring in a more diverse population of students. And as we do that, the classical robots and cars and fluid mechanics may not appeal to this broader set of students, uh, and so. We sort of have to 
turn things around a little bit in, in terms of the problems that we pose or the projects that we have in classes, is to be inclusive. Uh, so what are your thoughts about this changing demographics and how to realign your projects and coursework yeah. to, to address that? Yeah, so um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we look at is, is uh, you know, across our entire curriculum. Um, so I'll, I'll stick with fluid mechanics on that one. You know, one of the grand challenges is clean, accessible clean water. Um, so that one works great for fluid mechanics. And, and that's, you know, especially with the millennials coming through, you know, they're interested in these, like, these new challenges. These, these are the things we need to do to save the earth. And so um, tapping into those actually seems to really, the students will really latch onto those. Um, we've got a lot of that in our curriculum, for example, so we're doing that in our intro to engineering classes and then we have some senior projects and we bring in some of our arts and sciences students working with our engineering students and, and have the Grand Challenge Scholar Program. Um, so, so in that case, if you've got it sprinkled in, then, then occasionally then you can throw in the fun thing here and there. You've got robot sumo wrestling and, and people dealing with their Uncle Mortimer who's crazy. Um, so, so it's just a little bit of a sprinkling. So you're actually, and this goes back to you know, what, what Lawrence asked, you know, it's kind of sprinkling a little bit of everything for everybody so eventually you get every one of those students. Um, and and tapping, into, tapping into the the societal problems oftentimes will really bring together that diversity of your student audiences. That's what we do. So what else? Um, so I can speak to within our university, we have kind of this program which is like a, a breadth where you take your, your history class, your, you know, your social sciences and things like that. But they want to do things that are also what they call, say, crossing boundaries. And so we've actually made that engineering course with the sumo bots, that mechatronics course, a crossing boundaries course, where we talk about the societal impacts of, of autonomy and things like that within robotics, within cars, topics of today that they start from what has the microprocessor done? You know, like how has that revolutionized everything that we're staring at today, right? All the way up to what are the things that Ford's magazine is projecting as they're gonna be their careers or possible careers in 2030. And we talk about those more of in like a reflection pieces and things like that. So it allows them to start thinking about what they were doing, would be doing as engineers, instead of being altruistic when they're in college and then going and taking an engineering job right when they're done, they're starting to imagine what kind of jobs are out there, how the, how the profession has evolved and where it's going. And so those are actually really helpful conversations that kind of take the emphasis off of some of the technical side as well, and draw in those people so that we can understand what it is that interests them and what it is that is driving them. We talk about it at um, Dayton because a Catholic school is finding your vocation. And so that's something that we continually do throughout our curriculum is we want to have people find more than a job. We want them to think about what their career might be. I, th I mean, I'd love to, to follow on if anyone wants to pick it up. Just sort of curious. Um, have any of you imagined or, or tried anchoring sort of your, or course of you've anchored your sort of core project on something that was perhaps less traditional, right? Cause I think that we certainly encountered sort of supplemental activities that, it, that seek to sort of expand and cross boundaries, but I think it's, it's also easy to still sort of sit close to, I mean, in our situation, like you can say, oh, here's a fighting robot. It's like, okay, that, We'll do some extra stuff, but at the core, there are people who are just against cars or against fighting robots. And have you explored ways of actually anchoring in something that might actually be less traditional? And so my uh, chemical engineering thermodynamics course has a, uh, a big segment that's about food safety. Uh, and it's, you walk in thinking it's about engines, and it is about engines, uh, but uh, I am very conscious of not making it a course that it assumes that you have a lot of experience with cars or a lot of interest in cars. Um, you're an engineer, so heat and work, we gotta, we gotta work about that. But really, thermodynamics describes, uh, I was just talking about this yesterday, why, why a Twinkie stays the way it is. 
Like, that's, and you're like, well, Twinkies aren't important. Yeah, but food safety is important. Um, and it, and it's, it's cross-cutting, um, and, and I like that. And uh, um, the course also has a component of, of public service where uh, you have to explain something about thermodynamics through a YouTube video to a general audience. And we, get, we uh, access through that a lot of student interests. Like they bring in, sometimes they're showing it, thermodynamics through a dance party or thermodynamics through um, a hot tub or thermodynamics <laughs> through uh, raking leaves at the playground and uh, all of that stuff really allows us to speak to a much broader audience because it's not just the way I look at things. For me, um, that idea of some anchor that's cross-cutting and relatable to everybody, uh, in a control systems course, that anchor goes all the way back to like Wiener's cybernetics, right? Feedback is everywhere. Uh, and so I try to, to make the course <laughs> about feedback. Um, not about robots in particular. So although the students are doing robot projects, we talk about, um, so as the students make the robots do more and more, their loop times slow down and the robot starts to go unstable even though the predictions say it shouldn't. And we talk about drunk driving. Uh, we talk about walking around uh, when you're really tired and how humans use feedback and how feedback is everywhere. Um, so I think, I think that, again, as long as we, uh, one thing that we can do is that we can make sure that even if we are in some technical space that is, um, you know, pretty specialized, whether it's going up north or driving a robot around a track, that we realize, I mean, as professors, this is great for us, too, to realize really how fundamental what we're trying to show the students is. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I'd love to do a check on time. I'm not sure. Exactly how long we should keep it. 35 doing. after. 35 so, after. Take a few more questions. All right. So I have a, a quote that resonates with me, and it's if it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. And when it comes to assessment <laughs> of sort of these little small projects versus I'm going to give you something that's sort of grand and aspiration, and you're going to have to do all these little small things on your own. How, can you talk about uh, a proficiency versus growth mindset, and like, what are you looking for? What are you assessing? I've also heard from venture capitalists that like, it's very dangerous to pick winners, but you can pick losers. And so what do you think about, like, everybody gets an A except for the people that fail? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that one first? Uh, well, let me let me address just a little bit about assessment of entrepreneur mindset versus, let's say, our technical content start, um, which may not you know hit to the heart of your question or not, but it, maybe it'll give a broad overview. But you know, one one of the things that I get asked off, often is, um, what if your students don't discover the opportunity. What if they walk right by the Easter egg and here's my final assignment, here you go. Um, ultimately, my technical learning objective is still met. That, that, that's what the important key was. So, you know, I'm, I'm grading through their reports and I'm, I'm looking for all those things that they need to know by the time they exit that course. Um, since the entrepreneurial mindset is spread throughout the entire curriculum, um, they're getting pieces of it over and over and over again. Um, so this little, like, very distinct assessment um, sometimes becomes somewhat unnecessary. You're watching a lot more closer by the time they get to their senior year because you're saying, have you picked up on these little things as we're going? Are, are you more curious now? Or do you know what to do with your curiosity? And we can ask those specific questions. Um, so depending on where we're at in the curriculum, we're, we're very particular about how, how it's assessed. Um, I'll still do a whole bunch, like every time we present um, an entrepreneurially minded learning type of activity, we'll usually do a student survey. So we'll get some indirect input from them just to see if they're picking up on the clues. Um, but, uh, but not necessarily any real specific, like <clears throat> here's, here's what we're watching for. So there, there's kind of our big picture overview on it. If anybody can get down into the weeds a little bit better. Well, um I'm not sure if this gets down into the weeds a little bit better, but I, I think it, at least in our course, we are teaching seniors, and you know, it's fall semester, senior year. It's 
end, right? But uh, we tackle this a lot in terms of the design of the assignments first, okay? So um, the entrepreneurial mindset and Lafayette's meta mindset model, which supports it, are, you can apply them at any scale, all the way down to like a homework assignment, right? So if something is, uh, a really direct question that's not really a question that's assessing the entrepreneurial mindset, but if a daily homework assignment has two questions, one of them will have baked into it the need to go back and synthesize in some way. So for us, we really try to work that into the design of the course so we can assess using the data we actually have uh, on our spreadsheet. You know? So um, even in exams and discussion questions, we just have like a, a check mark. Uh, four points versus five points. Are, are, are they really synthesizing or are they just, you know, um, sort of parroting back some of the things that they've learned? Yeah, I think it all comes down to these things aren't unintentional, right? So it's, it's one of your objectives and you have, um, when I look at my specific course outcomes, right, and in just the thermodynamics course, it runs to 10 pages by the end of the class. So there's all these line items in there some of which have been pre-selected as the things that I do to pass on to ABET, but I can use the exact same process to look at mindset, to look at the technical outcomes, to look at you know, their writing outcomes, for example. Separate from grading. <laughs> I find it kind of interesting that, um, I don't know if you've ever been a, like witness a student who really just got into something, right? Like they just dug into it and they went way beyond what you asked them to do, right? They found value in that. They, th they thought it had impact, right, in terms of what they were learning, whether or not it was, like, really important to have robots smash into each other or anything like that. They liked the coding aspect, or they liked the building of the robot aspect, and they just went after it. And I find that when that happens, the students learn a whole lot more and are discovering a little bit more about what it is that really drives them. So having kind of, I've, I've taught both of these courses that I've talked about and I've had other people really re revamp portions of those courses. We kind of just mix and mingle. Um, they really, you know, it's finding that thing that drives them that it starts to see where their potential is. And so I love it when I have something that is open-ended. You know, it's really tough to grade. I'll, I'll agree on that. But I can still go in and I can say, I just picked like the, the toughest professor in our department and I say, you know, I won't, I'm gonna grade this like Dr. Henrik would grade this. And the students know what that means, right? They know that that's like a technical rigor on whatever it is they're gonna explore on. So it kind of gives them a context of what I'm looking for. But then I don't tell them you know, this is exactly how you need to get your robot. I say, have your robot go five feet forward and then five feet back, right? That means it could drive forward and then go in reverse. It could turn around, come back. It, you know, it, it could go there, come around the room, <laughs> come back to there. They start playing around with it if they're into it, right? And so they find value in those things and I just keep exploring with those. And so I like the experimentation course after having given, knowing that they have taken that mechatronics course because they have a little bit more confidence in trying to build up some things that they're trying to do. And I find a little bit more about what, they, what interests them. All those examples that I gave, the students came up with them and we had to dig into, you know, different websites to figure out how, how to connect things up and, and things like that. Thank you. I think I'll take the liberty of adding just in maybe one more question. Um, I'm curious, I think all of you have, have referenced uh, entrepreneurial mindset, meta mindset as things that you can point to and kind of leverage in helping your students think about, well, how they deal with certain aspects of their life. Okay, this is, it's, it's, you can point to the, the meta mindset and say, this is why we're struggling with this uncertainty and this ambiguity. And I'm wondering if you have advice to to, to all of us who might not either in our, or how do, we, how do we introduce that, especially if we don't necessarily have 
an explicit sort of excuse for making this frustrating, right? Because it's like, well, this is part of the entrepreneurial process. You can say, well, that's why this is painful. Like, like how, do we, how do we deal with that? How do we, how do we navigate that? Well, um, for me, I think the, the biggest thing that, that changed when we started doing this was really just how honest we were with the students about what we were going through um, at the same time. I mean, we, when we redesign a course, we go through that same thing, right? I mean, we are taking deliberate, hopefully deliberate risk um, in redesigning our course, and we are refining our discipline process of teaching. And I think being transparent with the students and modeling that for them is a huge, huge thing, right? So even if you don't have um, an explicit framework that you want to use and introduce them to this uh, type of thing with, you can still be transparent and explicit with the students about um, what it is that you're doing when you're answering their questions or when you're deciding how to grade these open-ended projects, right? And I think that helps a lot because the students um, want to see this modeled, right? They have this image of us as Omnip omniscient and omnipotent sometimes, uh, and you know maybe you want to maintain that facade, but I certainly don't. I, I want them to know that you know, especially as seniors, it's time to start seeing people as colleagues, and uh, I think being explicit with them helps a lot. Yeah, it's. Uh, I want to. I want to bank off of that some. Our, you know, our freshman year, we've got this you know kind of this design studio, and then the sophomore year, we've got another design studio for them. And uh, one of the things we're looking for in the instructors for that is that they're extremely transparent, like you said. Like, like they're, they're flat out telling the students, like, this is not a traditional course. You're not going to be given, like, here's, here's a set of problems to solve, and they came from the back of the chapter, right, and, and turn those in next week. Uh, it, it's, it's a very different type of thing, a different way for them to think. So immediately they're comparing, and, and I'll just pick an example out of a, out of a hat here, you know, <laughs> to, their, to their chemistry course or their calculus course, or maybe to their another traditional, you know, materials course in engineering, that maybe that one's a little bit more traditional. And so they really are just answering questions out of the back of the textbook. But, um, but in these other studios, we're kind of setting them up to say, we need you to think different. We need you to, because it's not just about sitting in a cubicle and solving a problem that they hand you, you solve it, and then they give you another one. That's not how it works. Um, so we're clear about that. And, and then, like you said, we, we tell them up front, we're like, you know, we're, we're kind of messing with, uh, with the way the curriculum we're going to be going through along with you to make it better for you when you graduate. By the time they're seniors, and we've watched this over the past six years now, uh, by the time they're seniors and they're working on, like, their capstone project, um, it, it's it's really cool to see how how they <coughs> how they dig into their projects a little bit differently than than when I was a senior student and, and working on my capstone project. We were like, well, just tell us, like, what are we supposed to do? And, yeah, and they're instead that. they just start asking us all these really weird off the wall questions. Like, <laughs> where'd you get those? Well, you told me that the freshman year to ask you stupid questions. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> that works. <laughs> Let's do that. So uh, so that's one way you know you can go about it. Yeah, and and I really like the whole concept of. A value creation. I think that speaks, can speak to all students. That someone's going to hire you or you're going to do your own thing, but the only reason you're going to do that is you're trying to change the world. You're trying to make something better. That's value. That's what that is. And uh, here are some ways where we can train you, make you better, not train you, give you more practice at creating value in the world. Yeah, and I'll just echo, echo that, um, you know, being up front with the students about what you're attempting to do, because it might be a little bit different from what they're, what they're used to, especially if they're coming from like a calculus course or a physics course where they, I don't, they could be, you know, doing things differently, but a lot of times they're doing their traditional because they're trying to get the skill sets built, not anything, just the technical. Um, the other thing that I do though, is we always have our end of the year evaluations. You know, those ones that for us, we get them right before Christmas. So we're, you know, nice present. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I really try to tell my students that, you know, they're anonymous, fill them out. Please give us comments on the course, right? Yep. Because I'm going to look at these comments. I'm going to filter them a little bit, right? <laughs> um, but I'm going to get a general feeling on how well things went, right? 
and I'm going to tell them that I want as much participation as possible on those evaluations. Because if I only get 10%, I really don't know. I mean, my area is really in, you know, doing studies with robots on people. So the more N you have and the more people you have, the more you know how well it's going to work. And so knowing that there's so much variability in the classroom, so much diversity in that classroom, what I do is I actually tell them some of the things that I've changed from the course from the last semester based on those evaluations and things that I resonate that I needed to do better or we needed to do better um, in order to achieve the objectives for the course. And so having those other students in the course is helpful for me. For seniors, it's a little more challenging and things like that, but, uh, or senior level course, because those students that are my TAs or my helpers can actually say, yeah, we, we had that, we, we appreciate him doing that. You have no idea like how much of a pain this was. But they, we don't know whether the thing that we're changing is also going to be a pain. But we're still trying to improve. And so the, the students appreciate that upfront knowledge and knowing that what they say at the end, what they've learned, um, that we're trying to assess that and we continually evolve. Awesome. Thank you. So I think we're good. What? Just take a moment and say thank you all for your participation. Thank all of our wonderful speakers today for, for their answers. Thank you. Thank you.